Hi, uh, welcome to today's uh, tutorial. My name is Dr. Jude Jebu, and today we are going to be talking a little bit about uh, Euler deconvolution. Uh, this um, tutorial is going to be in two parts. This first part is to talk about the theory, while the second part is to talk about, I talk about we demonstrate uh, using, doing this process using OASIS montage. So in this first video, the first part, we are going to talk about the theory behind Euler deconvolution. My name is Dr. Jude Jepu again, and um, you can contact me through this uh, email address. What is Euler deconvolution? Euler deconvolution is a geophysical method that uses potential field data to estimate the locations and depths of subsurface geological structures or anomalies. Euler deconvolution uses Euler's equation to describe the relationship between special derivatives of a potential field and the sources causing these anomalies. This method calculates Euler solutions, providing estimates of depths and locations of potential subsurface sources or anomalies. In doing performing the process of Euler deconvolution, Two methods basically are used, which is the standard Euler deconvolution and the located Euler deconvolution. They are both similar but have their basic differences. Now, for standard Euler deconvolution, it involves inverting Euler's homogeneity equation over a window of data at every grid point. It also generates solutions on anomaly edges. And even in areas which are free of anomalies, this is not a good thing, and that's one of the downsides of the standard Euler deconvolution. It also has an unchanging window size, biasing towards solutions of varying magnitude. It generates approximately, approximately a million solutions over a thousand by thousand data grid. Now, for the final solution sets, even when refined, still retains a large number of extraneous depth estimates. For the located Euler deconvolution, it, it, it utilizes the Blakely test to identify grid peaks. It starts by calculating analytical signal, identifying peaks, and using these solutions, these locations rather, for Euler deconvolution. It produces fewer solutions than the standard Euler deconvolution. Now, one of the advantages of using the located Euler deconvolution is that solutions are estimated only over recognized anomalies. It's against the standard Euler deconvolution, which even gives solutions in areas where there are no anomalies. Also, it has a varying window size based on the size of, of the anomaly. That is unlike the standard Euler deconvolution, which has its window size unchanged throughout the process. And also, the final solution requires few uh, depth estimates as against that of standard Euler deconvolution, which, pro which um, uh, produces very, very large number of uh, depth estimates. Now, how do we understand the processing sequence? of um, the Euler deconvolution process. You start by preparing and grading the data and processing this grid. Uh, you filter and extract gradient grids, that is the DZ, uh, the derivative along the horizontal, on the x-axis, on the y-axis, and then the uh, derivative on the vertical axis, that is the DZ. Now, after this has been done, the grid is analyzed. And uh, we run the standard Euler deconvolution for each structural index. Now we have various structural indices, which I'm going to explain soon. And um, for that is for the standard Euler deconvolution. Uh, you can do this for the located Euler deconvolution by analyzing the grids and running the Euler deconvolution for each of the structural ind indices that you have chosen. After thereafter, the plots. Uh, could be could be visualized. You plot the results and visualize them on screen. And now, just after this, 
you window the results based on your certainties and the window sources, which will be described in the next slides, and then the final map is plotted. Now, if you do not get the desirable results from this, uh, the windows, uh, the results that you have windowed, you continue to repeat all this process until you find something that is uh, acceptable to you. Now, but you have to note that in situations where structures of low structural index are sought, especially those ones that are less than one, it may just be better for you to start with the first vertical derivative, that is the Z of the potential field uh, data, rather than the total field. For example, if you are using the magnetic or the gravity field data that you have obtained. Now, for processing, running this process using OASIS montage, EULA 3D operates only on gridded data and through the usage of the .grd files, that is the grid files of the OASIS montage. So your data should be gridded and uh, to produce these GRD files. Now remember that the quality of the results that you are going to get are completely dependent on how this data is gridded. But then we have some methods for you or some acceptable uh, rules uh, to grid your data. You know, because if this data is not gridded well enough, potential problems that may arise include uh, like things like not knowing or not imputing a very good survey height above the sources, and uh, even when leveling your data after it has been acquired, choosing a grid interval in relation to the line or sample interval from which your data has been, uh, has been acquired, and of course, the line spacing or the interval uh, through which you have acquired this data. So the general rule of the term is that for line-based data, if you have your line-based data, the grid interval that you're going to choose should be one eighth to one quarter of the line spacing uh, that you have chosen. For example, if your line spacing is uh, 500 meters, the rule of the thumb is you should choose something like 125 or 100 meters uh, grid spacing. Now, if your data was randomly collected and your points were randomly located, an interval of a quarter to half of the nominal sample interval is commonly used. Remember, these are not set in stone, but these are appropriate guide from experience. This actually uh, works best for uh, many use cases. So although careful low-pass filtering can improve data quality, one must be careful in doing this because this may also impact on how shallower sources are represented and their resolution and depend on the target or depend on your project, uh, these um, shallower sources may just be what is needed. So once you are doing this low pass filtering, you should be careful because low pass filtering actually uh, impacts on uh, shallower sources because it enhances uh, those deeper sources as against um, uh, the, the shallower sources. So when calculating this gradient, it's beneficial to add a small amount of upward continuation to the grid. Of course, this will be demonstrated when we go to the practical session using OASIS montage. And this distance should just be about one grid cell size. That should be sufficient enough for us to take care of those challenges that may arise from doing this upward continuation. However, such of this filtering should be done only should be applied only if necessary. And the upward continuation distance should be minimized to remove just the noise without causing much problem to our data sets. Now, to perform EULA deconvolution, there are certain processing parameters that we must impute in order for us to get some very reliable and acceptable results. And these include, amongst other things, the structural index, the maximum percentage of depth tolerance, the window size, maximum distance to accept, and the flight height of the survey elevation. So I'm going to describe each of these one after the other so that we will gain more context about them. So for the structural index, it's usually abbreviated as the SI, it's an exponential factor corresponding to the rates at which the field falls off with distance for a source of a given geometry. 
Now, the value of the SI parameter depends on the type of source body that you are looking for and the type of potential fuel data that you are using. For example, if you are using the magnetic data, uh, typically you will have the SI of zero, which will represent contact, 0 0.5 for thick step, uh, 1.0 for seal and dike, 2 for pipe, 3 for sphere. And as you can see from this table, uh, for gravity data, once we impute the SI as 2, it gives us sphere. And for uh, the seal and dike, uh, so the important thing is just take note of all these so that when you are using any of these fields, you know the right SI to apply. But still suffice it to say that you can still apply some of these SI in between this number. For example, you can still use an SI of 0 0.1 or 0 0.2, depending on your use case and depending on what you want to achieve at the end of the day. Now, the next one is the maximum percentage debt uh, tolerance. This establishes the uh, acceptable solutions, that is, uh, solutions where the tolerance is less than the error estimate. By default, in all system, 15% is used, which is usually a decent place to start when first evaluating the data. Now, fewer but more dependable solutions will arise if you give a lower uh, uh, tolerance. So that means if you want uh, some few, fewer the depth estimates, for example, uh, you reduce this uh, uh, the number from 50% to, to something that is less. Also, the next one is the window size. The window size determines the area. In grid cell sizes uh, used to calculate the Euler solutions, all points in the windows are used to solve the Euler equation from a source position. Now, Euler deconvolution works best when the search window is large enough to include the entire anomaly being analyzed, but not so large when it contains multiple anomalies. Now, since a typical survey contains anomalies of various sizes, it may be necessary to run this Euler deconvolution a few times uh, with different window sizes. Now, the other uh, factors that we must impute uh, whenever we want to process Euler deconvolution is the maximum distance to accept. Now, this parameter specifies the maximum distance offset from the center of the search window. Now, the deconvolution result is most accurate when the source is centered within the search window. So, solutions that are located far off that center may just be rejected. So, generally, Solutions located outside the boundary of the search windows uh, may be rejected as erroneous. And the last one is the flight height or the survey elevation. Now, this determines the manner in which the results are displayed. For example, the units in which the solution, the depth, are given, uh, the depth values are given are taken from the grids. For draped airborne surveys, you enter the flight height and the values, the depth estimates will be returned as values below the ground surface. Now, for barometric airborne surveys, the survey elevation uh, will be entered, and this will be the, the depth sources will be given as heights above the sea level. Now, when that process is run, uh, these are some of the results that are going to come, the channel names that will come. You have the X underscore Eula, this gives you the solution for the x coordinates, the y underscore Euler, the solution for the y uh, coordinates, and everything. When we go further, we'll see how to use some of these things to actually window our data, especially the DZ and all that. So this, all these ones will be very well explained when we come to the practical session. But this just gives you an idea of the results that you're going to get. For example, this x offset, it's uh, the value that given the difference between where the solution uh, is located and the window that was selected during the, the, the process. So, and the, lastly, the flag, the mask, the flags uh, where uh, the solutions can be plotted or where they cannot be plotted. So, at the end of the day, it's also important for us to window our results because sometimes some of the solutions that are given may not be acceptable. So after obtaining a solution database, just like the one we showed in the previous slide, we must then extract the solutions that you consider appropriate. Now you can use five main values for windowing, and that is the solution depth, 
the depth uncertainty, that is the DZ column, and the horizontal uncertainty in percentage, that is the DXY. And of course, you know, one can use the X offset and the Y offset, although these ones most times from experience are not very, uh, not very well used, but this depth or certainty are actually the ones that are most used. And if you have an idea of where, of the depths of these anomalies that you're expecting, this solution depth can still be useful when you are windowing your results. So I hope you find this useful. And in the next video, what we're going to do is to demonstrate how to perform this ULA deconvolution, knowing fully well that you have understood the little theory and the background behind the ULA deconvolution. Thank you very much.